um, I, I think we have two astounding speakers uh, and I'm honored to be able to introduce them. The title of this program is What's New in ALS Therapy? And there's an update on new clinical trials and ALS research. Um, I wanted to take one minute uh, before um, I introduce our first speaker um, and talk about something maybe a little bit old in ALS therapy, but uh, it's important because it, it shows how one learns from the speakers, but, but also from nurses such as Jumana and uh, many of the other nurses. And this goes back some years when I was in the ALS clinic and a uh, pastor um, brought in um, uh, his wife who had ALS and had significant problems um, uh, with weakness. Um, really, as a result, she looked a little bit unkempt. And I evaluated this patient. And my nurse at that time uh, looked at the patient and said, I know what we could do for you, what you need. And I was thinking to myself, gee, what, what does Roberta have in mind? And Roberta said, I'm going to give you a shampoo. Now, it turns out that, that Roberta actually, prior to being a nurse, was a hairdresser. And so she went in the back room and shampooed this ALS patient's hair. And as they were leaving, I saw them with big smiles both the patient and the husband. So uh, the moral of the story is, yes, we, we're all looking for what's new in ALS therapy, but there are spiritual interactions that one could do as a caregiver, as a spouse, as a friend, and those were meaningful in the past, and they're still very meaningful. And if we don't pay attention to those, we probably don't have the holistic, comprehensive treatment of ALS patients we need. So um, I'm going to move on from that story to introduce Dr. Merit Sikovic, who is Chief of Neurology at Mass General Hospital, and the Julianne Dorn Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School. And just to put things in perspective, if you ask me who's the most prominent ALS person involved in clinical trials from the beginning and the middle and the end. Um, I think that the top 10 people that would be listed would have Merritt's name. And really as a result, she won the 2009 Sheila S. A. A. L. S. Award, the 2017 Forbes Norris Award from the International Motor Neuron Disease Alliance, the 2017 Pinnacle Award from the Boston Chamber of Commerce, and the 2019 Ray Adams American Neurological Association Award. And I probably forgot a few. Um, I'm sorry, Merritt. Uh, anyway, we're, we're looking forward to uh, your perspective um, on what's new in ALS therapy development update on ALS treatments, genetic approaches, and trials. Please, Merit, thank you. Thank you, Ray, and thank you, Jemana, for inviting me here. And, um, and it's a pleasure to be on the same Zoom with Kuldeep. We work so closely together with the ALS Association, and they support so much of the work that's made us get to the point where we have uh, time and uh, enough content to really talk about where therapies are going in ALS. So I'm very happy to be here. Part of uh, why many of us, like Ray and myself, stay in the field, we're, we're all, uh, we fall for our patients in the way that you just described, and we share this passion and commitment to try to uh, find treatments and find ways to make life better for everybody with ALS until, as Ray said, we can all retire, which we're looking forward to do as fast as possible. Um, so I'm going to uh, share my screen here and see if this works. Thank you. 
So I'm happy to spend the next uh, about you know, 25, 30 minutes talking about where we are on therapy development. And everything we do is tied to working as a community together. So the scientists like Ray in the lab and the clinicians, uh, the patients and the foundations. And I, I just want to take a moment to really thank uh, one of my patients, Sean Healy, pictured here, whose um, you know, really vision uh, last year um, uh, allowed him and his friends to support, to give us initial support so that we could launch a new way of doing trials in ALS, which I'll tell you about. But there's many, many other new things going on, and I'm going to try to give you a high-level update on where we are on, on therapies, all types of therapies in ALS. So there's several treatments that are in what I call late-stage testing, which means that if these are positive, they would be the next treatments to go forward in, uh, to marketing. And I'd say in my 25 years in ALS, I've never seen so many things in late stage testing. So that gives me a lot of hope that we're gonna have some more marketed treatments to provide our patients. There's also a huge therapeutic pipeline. There's, uh, as you'll see, more than 160 companies working on ALS, that's unheard of. You know, there used to be a time when there might be one, you know, even, and that wasn't so long ago. So, and that tells me that, that there's enough science and enough targets um, and a pathway to get uh, drug mark uh, to approval that there's uh, industry in interest in this uh, field, which we need. And then lastly, because of so many things in the pipeline, we can't test things one time, one at a time, and we have to get innovative about how we can do this faster so that we can get the best treatments for our patients as quick as possible. And, and Ray, uh, I know you're a, a lab-based scientist and a clinician, so I apologize in advance for summarizing all of ALS science on one slide, but I want to, to, to I'm a clinical trialist, but um, we learn a lot from the genetic forms of the illness, even though most people with ALS don't have the genetic form, about 10% do, uh, but there's overlap in the biologies of what happens in the people who have the illness because of a genetic change, uh, genetic mutation, something they inherit, and those who, who get it for other reasons. And we learn uh, what um, biologies might be uh, not working well and what can we target. So we've, we've learned a ton, the fields have learned a ton, that there's definitely problems with how your body takes care of um, proteins that are perhaps made incorrectly, how you move these proteins up and down the motor uh, nerve axons, how you make proteins in the first place called RNA biology. And that um, as you look in people with ALS, that we see some common themes on with uh, protein uh, misfolding, something called TBP43, and how that's handled. And all this tells the clinical trials and the clinicians and the companies that there's things that we can target to try to um, slow down this illness and ultimately stop it. And then what we really want to do even after that is to prevent it from coming in the first place. So a lot of the treatments are targeting um, these different pathways. And it might be that a lot like in some of the cancer treatments that we're going to need um, many, you know, several like a cocktail treatments for people. And we might need different treatments for different people um, based on their biology. But we're finally at the point where we're developing those tools to be able to understand how to do that better. So I mentioned this uh, 100, now I have to update my slide, 160 companies, but I wanted to highlight a few of the treatments. Um, and and uh, um, I'll tell you the color code are, the ones in red are in what I call the late stage testing, meaning that if those treatments are positive, that might be all we need to do to get to a drug to market. The light blue are things that have been in earlier phase trial, but have positive results. And just to have that many uh, things in late testing, that many red things, and that many things with positive uh, treatments, blue, is, is just amazing uh, for this field. So just to highlight the ones in red a little bit, the AMX0035 is um, a treatment that, um, that just finished a trial. They announced the positive results in a press release, and they're shortly going to show all that data. Um, RM is a... a, a a drug that helps uh, with that protein misfolding I mentioned. And that's in the late stage testing that's expected to read out in the first half of 2021. Neuron, uh, the other one in red, is a, a stem cell trial. Uh, those results are expected at the end of this year. Uh, and there's another stem cell trial called, uh, with a company called CoreStem that's also um, in late stage testing. 
So a lot of activity um, in there. Um, the good news is that there's lots of groups that are working together to try to go through this pipeline quickly. And one of them is the Northeast ALS Consortium, uh, which the uh, University of Chicago is part of um, and, and has 134 centers really throughout the United States and the world that work together on therapy development. And this is important in a rare disease uh, where you want to learn from everybody with the illness and you want to make sure you lower the barrier um, to science and, and you speed things up. And so this consortium is now led by John Glass and uh, actually Tim Miller and uh, Jinzy Andrews um, and has um, more than 500 investigators. And these are the whole teams, the nurses, the physical therapists, the scientists, the clinicians, the patients, all working together to try to solve this disease. Um, and um, this foundation has been supported by the ALS Association almost since its uh, initiation in, in the early, uh, in the mid 1990s. And that has allowed us to do some really important things for the field. So every study that we do, we ensure that the samples collected uh, in those studies are shared for the community in a huge biorepository uh, that the ALS Association helped us start and is currently supporting. Uh, we share all the, um, the clinical data, particularly from the group of people that aren't, don't get the, the um, drug, and that's an open source um, uh, database called PROACT and also, again, supported by the ALS Association. And this, uh, these data sets have been used by scientists all over the world and companies all over the world. And it's part of why when companies start going to ALS, they feel like the, the pathway has been paved for them, and then it's easier for them to to get the knowledge they need to be able to move forward their drug. Another thing that this group did together is they really looked at how our trial started. I mean, there was this traditional way that every hospital in the trial would review the protocol and decide if it was okay to, to go forward. That process could take a whole year to get like 60 centers off the ground. So we developed a, a much better way called the central IRB where one hospital reviews it and all the hospitals in the trial rely on that one hospital review. And that can shave about uh, nine months of time off a of startup. And as we know, as I hear from our patients, um, there is an ALS clock, and that's a clock that has to move fast. And so uh, one of the things this group does is it looks at these things that slow, slow process down and tries to solve them. And, and, and setting up that central IRB was critical. And again, we did that with the support of the ALS Association. So, uh, so we now have um, three marketed drugs for people with ALS. Uh, Rilazole and Radicava both uh, slow down the disease course. Um, not enough, you know, because we need more than that, but it is definitely a good start. And then Nudexa, which is the symptomatic treatment for something called pseudobulbar affect. But there's a lot of other things in the pipeline because we really want to get to the point where we're um, having dramatic effects on the disease. Um, and I wanted to, to bring up that there's three approaches right now that are, are underway to try to, to accelerate therapy development. And they each have their, their benefits and each have their challenges. Uh, but but um, I wanted to share a little bit about why trials are designed certain ways. One way to get to a quicker answer is to try to um, pick a group of people who are more likely to respond for, for your drug. And you can do that with clinical features or you can do that with biological features. And so Daravone, which is uh, one of the marketed drugs, they took a group of people that were early in their illness and progressing fast, and they were able to show in six months that their drug slowed down the illness by a third. The Amalix study I, meant, I mentioned did the same thing. They, they used clinical features to try to get a group that was more similar to each other so that in a smaller number of people in a shorter time, they could get an answer. And Neuron also did it that way. So that's one trial approach. Um, Another way is to say, I know that my drug works on this biology, and I'm only going to pick people who have the, that biology. Um, and for example, some of the gene therapy trials are doing that approach. And that is, as a scientist, that makes a lot more sense. But sometimes that's not possible to do. It's only possible to do if you have the tools to measure that biology. And then the last kind of new way is instead of testing every drug in its own trial, uh, build an infrastructure that can test multiple drugs at one time so that at the end of, let's say, six months, you get an answer to three or five drugs and not one. And I'll go through each of these. So this is the uh, Radicava drug, and this was approved uh, a couple of years ago in the U.S. And, and they, they did this um, technique of kind of taking early, fast, progressing patients, and they were able to show this 33% slowing of the illness at six months. 
But the challenge on this one is it leaves us not knowing, uh, does the drug only work in that population or, or is that just a good trial tool and actually works in everybody? And I'd say we still don't know this. Uh, the FDA did approve it for all forms of the illness and most of us do give it to everybody with ALS. Um, but that trial technique leaves uh, people a little bit not knowing all the answers. But that might be okay in an illness like ALS where uh, it's, it's probably better if you think a drug works to get it out to everybody while you work out some of these other questions. So the Amylife company, they have a drug called AMX0035. And uh, this was started by two young gentlemen uh, while they were college students who had an idea that there's so much going on in ALS, maybe you need to give more than one drug at a time. Maybe you need to target different biologies. And so they picked two drugs, one that worked on um, something called uh, molecular chaperoning. So this is part of your cell that helps um, uh, get rid of proteins that might not be made uh, correctly. And so they took this drug, sodium phenobutrate, uh, that, that uh, worked on that target. And they added it to another drug called Tudka, or terosodial, that works on how your cells make energy, or the mitochondria. And they showed in the lab that both these drugs could protect motor neurons, but they were much better when given together. They were synergistic. And so they did this trial in people with ALS that they announced in January uh, in a press release that it was a positive trial, meaning it hit its primary outcome measure. Um, the primary measure was um, the functional rating scale and to slow it by at least 30%. Now they haven't been able to re uh, report the full, uh, full data, but that's expected soon. So this is a hopeful approach. And it also tells you that um, the ideas can come from anywhere. This was a group, uh, these were two people that weren't ALS scientists. They hadn't even graduated from college, but they had a good idea and they came to the Northeast ALS Consortium and they asked the ALS experts for help and that group gave them help to get it all the way through this trial. And that's one of the things that I love about the ALS community. It, it really does lower the barriers and we all have the same shared passion and purpose to try to cure this illness. So, um, the other approach I want to talk about a little bit is targeting the biology, because this is the ideal way to do it. But sometimes you don't have all the tools to do it this way. But for the genetic forms of the illness, we really do have those tools. And, you know, the very first person I ever took care of with ALS, Susan uh, Welch here, she had the familial form of the ALS. Um, and uh, she was diagnosed in 1994, right after the first gene was found, the SOD1 gene that was found by many groups uh, here in Chicago and in Boston and all over the world. And um, uh, so we know now that that gene mutation causes the illness. And if you can lower the amount of that uh, protein, that that can uh, be effective in pre um, preventing motor disease that showed that. So in 2011, with the support of the ALS Association and the Muscular Dystrophy Association, uh, Tim Miller, myself, and Niels did the first gene, in a way, gene therapy study for ALS. Um, and it, it was a safety study, it was very safe, but it turned out that at that point, this was such a new technology that the type of treatment we were doing had some safety issues in the animal model. So and it had nothing to do with lowering SOD1, it really had to do more with the backbone of the delivery part of that. So uh, their company that was making this, Ionis uh, Pharmaceuticals, had to reboot and make a different version of it. And unfortunately, that takes time. It took about four years. Um, but fast forward to now, uh, a better version of it was made in a phase one trial was repeated, uh, a safety study with, with that drug. Uh, and this is now with Biogen and Ionis and uh, many uh, places all over the world. Um, and we just reported these results in the New England Journal of Medicine about a month ago. Um, and I'll just give you the high points. So this enrolled only people with the gene mutation in uh, something called SOD1. Um, and there were 50 participants. Um, most of them got the drug called Tefersin. And this is a drug that directly targets the uh, SOD1 and lowers the amount of the protein that's made. People got the drug in the spinal fluid space by uh, lumbar puncture. They got five treatments. Um, there was a 12-week dosing period and then a 12-week follow-up, and then everybody could roll over into what we call an open-label extension, where everybody gets the drug. And four doses were tested. And I'll just show you the high points. One is that the drug did what it's supposed to do. It lowered SOD1 levels. And you can see here in a dose-dependent manner with a, at the highest dose, 100 milligrams, 
it lowered it by almost 40%. And that was what we expected based on our uh, initial uh, pharmacokinetic studies in the animal models. So that's important because you want to make sure your drug is targeting what it's supposed to target. Um, this is some of the clinical data. Now, this was a small safety study, so it wasn't, didn't have enough people to be definitive, but there were definitely some in, really encouraging trends with people um, on the tefersion group, on the active treatment, progressing much slower than people who didn't receive the treatment in that 12-week period. Again, then everybody rolled over to open-label extension, which is what's happening now. So the other thing we want to do is, does it lower any marker of motor neuron damage? And so there's this relatively new marker called neurofilament that people think might be a good measure of what's going on in the motor neurons. And this drug was able to show that that, that neurofilament level, which is usually elevated in people with ALS, could be lowered by about 50% at 12 weeks by the, the treatment with tofersin. So that, that's also encouraging. So all this was really good data to suggest that if you can target uh, the cause of the illness, you can have an effect on the biology of the illness. Um, and now this has gone on into a phase three trial all over the world, and the results are expected in 2021. So we showed that it was safe, that we could reduce the SOD1 levels. There was at least a suggestion of good clinical effect and uh, really enough to go rapidly forward. And this trial was actually adapted and amended to go straight into phase three trials so that there was no delay. Um, everyone's going to be waiting eagerly for these results. Now this type of approach, this antisense oligo approach where you turn off a gene, is now also being used in a different form of genetic ALS caused by mutations in uh, chromosome 9 mutations, C9 or 72. So, and, and that result, those trials are ongoing. But even, even I wouldn't say better, but even related to this is that same technology can be used for um, tackling problems in sporadic ALS in the 90% of people who don't have the genetic form. So you can use the same uh, technology to turn up or turn down different proteins of interest. So for example, there's a trial that will start this fall, also by Biogen, where they're using the same technology, to, but to lower something called a taxin-2, which is a protein that we think is important in all forms of ALS. And so that trial is using a gene therapy technology but for sporadic disease. So we learn a ton from, from every, every, every type of trial that happens, and we can learn from the genetic forms of the illness to help uh, the more common sporadic. So that is just, it's just super exciting to be able to even like turn on and turn off genes in people. It sounded like science fiction 20 years ago, but there are other marketed drugs for other diseases of that approach. And it's now been in at least two trials in ALS and another one coming. So I want to switch in my last couple of minutes to the, the Healy platform trial, which I'm very excited to share. It started enrolling about three weeks ago. And now there's 12, 12 of our 54 centers are active and enrolling and another 18 to be open very soon. Um, so I, I think I'm going to hope to convince you that this is the right way to test treatments in AOS now and why. Um, and uh, the high points I would say is that this type of approach, which I'll describe, cuts the time to get into effective treatments in half. Okay, so and time is, is, is critical for AOS. It cuts the cost in, by about a third and increases the, the, the uh, number of people that are going to be on the active treatment during the trial by 67 percent. So it's, it's, it's got a lot of pluses in here. Um, and so um, taking a super conservative approach, and I'll say that I think we can do much better than this. If you assume, you know, one in 10 treatments that you test work, which again is, is I think we can do much better than that now, but to take that assumption, this is what the statisticians did. We, if we tested one drug at a time, we'd be here 12 years later before we found the first effective treatment. But if you do a platform approach, it'll take four years. Again, if you pick drugs that are better, have a, a better chance than 10%, it'll be even much faster than that. And you also need much fewer patients and many fewer people are, get, not, get the, what we call the placebo during the treatment. So there's good rationale for doing this. So in a typical trial, when you do test one drug at a time, you have to spend about a year kind of designing the protocol, getting all your sites, what we call building the stadium. Um, and then when the trial down again, um, it's, it's terribly inefficient. Uh, in the platform approach, you build that infrastructure once and you keep it going until you find the cures. And that could be a couple of years, it could be 
two years. I mean, it really depends on the drugs that you put in there. Um, but you never uh, dismantle this until you find it's an effective treatment. And that's what we're doing in ALS now. And so for a person that might enroll in a platform trial, you come in and you're, you are randomized, so you're assigned at random to any one of the available treatments. And we're starting with three, but you could, I mean, there have been platform trials in other diseases that have done 14 trials, 14 drugs at one time, but we're starting with three, with two more that we're gonna add shortly afterwards. So you get randomized to whatever one of the ones that are available. You'll know which treatment you're on, if you're on the first one, the second one, or the third one. And then there's another randomization uh, to drug or placebo. And here it's three to one. So 75% of people are gonna be on the active treatment and 25% on placebo. In the traditional way, it's usually 50-50. So it's uh, much again better for patients. And at the end of the six months, um, you, uh, you, everybody goes on open label extension. So everyone gets drugs. And the, what you do for the analysis is you take everybody in the active group, let's say it's gonna be 120 people in the, in the green active group, and you compare them to everybody in the placebo from all the groups. You're pooling the placebo group. So you still get that one-to-one -one comparison, that 120 to 120, um, but you're doing it by sharing the placebo group. And that's where you get the efficiencies of the cost, and you also get the increase, great huge increase for patients of the chance of being on the active drug during that 24 weeks. And again, everyone is on it after the 24 weeks. But people also have the option of after 24 weeks, if they wanna go and, and, and go into another arm, they can do that as well. So it's really uh, was built uh, with the patients kind of at the center and with a lot of input from patients. The other thing you can do in a platform trial is you can keep learning about the disease. So in a traditional trial, uh, let's say you do the trial, let's say the drug doesn't work, and the company's collected all these samples in the meantime, those samples belong to the company and they might or might not do more research on it. In a way, it could be a lost opportunity for the ALS field. In the platform trial, we're designing it that those fluids belong to the community. They're for ALS research, they're always gonna be used and always available so that you can keep learning about the biology of the illness. So, um, so we got a lot of input on this. Um, and uh, again, because of this amazing ALS community uh, with patients and, and the investigators and the scientists, we got buy-in uh, very quickly. And we also got buy-in from the FDA, who's very supportive of this way of lowering costs and being more efficient. So we designed uh, um, the trial uh, with the input of uh, all these people on this um, slide. And we hired the best statisticians out there who've done this for cancer. And uh, we, got, we formed a patient advisory committee that gave us uh, input on the design of the study as well. We picked 54 of our centers uh, throughout the Northeast ALS Consortium. We actually have about 25 other sites uh, who are kind of our backup sites who wanna, wanna join. And we're using that one ethics uh, central review that I mentioned that saves uh, time. Um, we actually, because of uh, the initial gift from the Healy family and AMG, we um, said we were going to pick the companies that could be the first ones, and we made it more into a grant. And so we had 30 applications, um, and the top five were picked. And now companies can continue to be part of this, uh, but they apply and they cover their entire cost. Um, we also got, um, as I'll show you later, we wrote grants to the ALS Association, which we received and very grateful for the um, IMALS um, and MDA and ALS Finding a Cure. So this is really a partnership between uh, philanthropy foundations uh, and industry. So the first five treatments we picked have different mechanisms of action. One is a complement five inhibitor um, and another a myeloproxate inhibitor. Those are both drugs that work on the immune system. And there's lots of data in ALS that the, the more activated one's immune system is, the faster the disease course. Uh, the, the fifth one on the list is also working on the immune system. These are all working in different ways. And I'd be happy if we have time to go into more of their biology. The third one is our gold nanocrystals that help catalyze reactions in the brain that improve cellular energy. The fourth one is a sigma-1 receptor agonist that helps plug some of the leakiness we see in how the, the genetic material in the cell gets from one area to the other, um, and also helps uh, stimulate um, survival of the motor neurons by uh, secretion of different growth factors. So these all had great science, and they were ready to go into patients. We met a couple times with the FDA, and I just want to say sometimes the FDA gets a bad rep, and, and, uh, but uh, I'd say here their interactions were phenomenal. 
Um, they, uh, they have told us we can meet with them as many times as we want. They're very supportive. They give us great feedback. And we got our, what we call our May Proceed letter for the platform trial in uh, January of 2020. Um, so we've, we've built this uh, master protocol. And every time we want to add another drug, and this is where the efficiency comes, instead of starting all over again at the kind of stadium again, we just amend the master protocol. So instead of something taking 12 months to start, we can start to take one or two months. So we can keep adding uh, drugs as more science is learned. Um, so uh, for this study, um, we did a lot of modeling to see what, uh, what uh, how can we be as broad as possible to allow as many people uh, in the trial as possible, but uh, also do it in a way that we can get an answer at 24 weeks on whether the drug works or not. And, and so we came up with these inclusion criteria based on that modeling. And we used that PROACT database I mentioned, which has all the pooled data from prior trials uh, to do that modeling. Um, so when people come in, again, uh, we did start in, uh, July, in mid-July, they're randomized to either regimen A, B, or C. Then there's another randomization to, uh, within the regimen at three to one and it's for 24 weeks. So uh, we were honestly going to start in March. We had a kickoff meeting. We had to switch to um, virtual in a, a really a short notice in March. Uh, timing wasn't ideal on this, uh, but we had a, our virtual meeting um, to train our sites. And uh, we, we had to um, put a little pause on it because of the pandemic, uh, but we kept working during that pause to change and modify the protocol so that it could be basically what I call COVID-19 proof, that we can do this trial and not stop no matter what happens with that pandemic. So I really do hope that it get, get, keeps moving in the right direction for that. So I hope I've convinced you that platform trials can really accelerate how you uh, go through a big pipeline when you have a great pipeline like you do in ALS. Um, there's a huge support for this from um, the, the FDA, from pharma companies, from clinicians and scientists, and most importantly, from the patients. It's a perpetual trial. It's going to continue until we find treatments that are effective. Um, it's open to companies to, to put in their drugs, and we have huge interest. We're getting lots of calls from companies that want to be part of this. And um, even more importantly, we're getting a lot of calls from patients who want to be part of that. And we're trying, uh, trying to open as many sites as possible, as fast as possible, so that people don't have to travel far to be part of the study. Um, so a lot of people support this, and, and a huge thanks to Kuldeep and uh, others at the ALS Association who have been uh, working with us from the beginning, uh, giving their input and giving their support, and they're part of our, our committee and working hand-in-hand -hand with us. So, um, and with that, I'll, um, I'll pass the, the Zoom mic back to Ray. Uh, thank you so much, Merritt. Um, does everybody hear me? Merritt, do you hear I me? I can hear you. I can okay. hear you. Okay. Um, so I, I wanted to uh, just take a minute and put this in perspective. Um, I would say 20, 25 years ago, um, if we had one clinical trial going, that was a lot. And I, I have to say that the clinical trials were not very sophisticated. I'm not sure that um, we knew how to run them as well as we do now. And over the years and, and decades, uh, it's been phenomenal. That number one, we have this large group. It used, it's called the Northeast ALS um, group of consortium, but, but really it's not Northeast, it's national or international, in fact. And um, we have very sophisticated statistics, uh, drug distribution, um, and clinical trialists. So it's, um, it's been a revolution. Uh, and you get that feeling when you realize, number one, the, there was a paper uh, that Merritt showed in the New England Journal of Medicine, July 2020, just for everybody, the New England Journal of Medicine, I don't know, we probably have 50 to 100 journals, and the New England Journal of Medicine has to be at the top 
Um, so this is uh, a great achievement. The SOD study with um, antisense oligonucleotides, um, all of this relies on not only knowing how to do clinical trials, but new technologies that are cutting edge that we couldn't have even begun to envision a while back. Um, and it's still moving along. So um, I'm optimistic about things. And I should mention, I don't know whether this is seen, but um, Shale, uh, this is his email address, and he is um, involved in the Healy Center trial at the University of Chicago. So it's S. Batnagar, B H A T N A G A R, at neurology. Dot BSD. Dot U Chicago. Dot EDU. Um, if we, you're not we sure. will post that at the video. Okay, great. We will send this in the, in the email. Chat.